The following program is brought to you by the Center for Educational Outreach at Baylor College of Medicine. Hello, my name is Greg Vogt and I'm with the Center for Educational Outreach at the Baylor College of Medicine. And I want to make sure that you have a sound education. Well, that's our topic today, sound. It's one of the most exciting things you can do with students because there's many, many different ways that you can demonstrate sound and actually make sounds in the classroom and challenge kids to create their own sounds. You can have a lot of fun with it, but it's important to understand just what is sound. So that's our first question here. What is sound? And you may be surprised, sound is actually a form of energy. I had to think about that myself when I first thought about that. And yeah, it is a form of energy. But then again, what we have to do is define what energy is. So energy is something that uh, takes many different forms. It's anything that can change the condition of matter or the ability to do work. Well, that kind of sounds funny there, but let's go further here. It's hard to define because energy changes form. So let's go through an example of energy changes and see how this all works. We're going to take an example that you probably use with your students, uh, the food chain. So we start out with the sun producing energy through a thermal nuclear reaction. So we the energy is transmitted across space as light and heat, when it finally reaches Earth, becomes heat. And that is taken in by plants to help power the process of photosynthesis. And the plants capture that energy in a chemical form, taking in carbon dioxide and water to build its structure. Well, that, that makes the plant, so we have chemical energy now. And that energy is then taken on by the cow. Well, again, it's chemical energy, the cow builds up its body mass. And then it becomes a, a hamburger, let's say. <laughs> and there's also vegetables and all that on there. But we're transferring this energy from one place to another. And then finally it goes to our worker who happens to be digging a hole. So that's a simple idea of, of uh, the food chain. But it really is also a, a, an example of energy change going from one form to another. Here's what happens. Is the energy used up when the worker eats the sandwich? No, it's not because it becomes something else. And the, the factory, or the, the, the worker there digs a hole and the ground is converting the chemical energy to mechanical energy. And all kinds of things happen. Well, the pile of dirt gets bigger, it keeps digging out the hole. So that's mechanical energy. But there's other kinds of energy too that come out. The worker gets very warm from all the work. Thermal energy is given off. And uh, the, the worker is perspiring and you've got uh, perspiration, the, the molecules of water evaporate, go up into the sky, become part of the rain that eventually falls and that wears down mountains and so forth and so on. What we're really showing here is many different kinds of energy that are converted from one form to another. But there is another kind here that I haven't shown yet, and that is that every time the, the worker smacks into the ground with a shovel, there's noise and dumps the, the, the dirt into the pile. There's noise and energy is transmitted that way. It transmits in three dimensions. It goes out and all the way. It goes into the ground. The sound moves that way. It goes into the air in three dimensions, kind of like a three-dimensional pond ripple. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can be transformed, we've just shown. We call this the conservation of energy. So it transfers from one form to another, but the total amount always remains the same. It never changes. So that's the total amount, not just for this little example, but the total amount for the universe. So let's go back to what is energy. Energy, we said before, is anything that can change the condition of matter or the ability to do work. All right, change in position, that's movement. So you can move something around. A change of state, well, maybe thermal energy melts ice, which evaporates uh, into water, which becomes a, a gas, it condenses, falls as rain, flows to the ocean, and so on and so forth. Well, sound is a form of energy because, and here are the reasons, it's an oscillation of pressure that is transmitted by waves through solids, liquids, and gases. Ooh, that sounds like a lot here. But really, we can summarize it up with one word, vibration. And that's what kids will probably know, and, and you've probably heard about before, sound is vibration. But that vibration can be transmitted, and that's where the energy part comes in. It's transmitted from one place to another. It can affect the air, it can affect solids, it can affect liquids. It does all kinds of things. Your kids will probably have some misconceptions about sound, and it's important to understand that what they have and, and try to work around those. Well, here's just a couple of very common misconceptions about sound that students often come to the classroom with. For example, if you hit an object harder, the pitch changes in the sound produced. So you have a light tap will cause it to make one, one pitch, and then you hit it harder, it'll change it, raise it or lower the, the, the pitch of the sound. That's not right. 
you can see and hear a distinct event at the same moment. Now, think about that. We watch movies, uh, all the great space battles, and, and uh, some spaceship blows up another, and immediately the other thing blows up. You can hear the sound transmitted through the vacuum of space. We get the idea that you can see things happening and hear them happening at the same time. Well, it turns out light travels that whole lot faster than sound does. So actually we get to see the event and if there is something to transmit the sound through, we hear it afterwards. Well, sounds can travel through empty space. That's another thing we get from the movies. You, you hear those sounds as they take place and really you can't. There's nothing to transmit the sound. Here's another one that kids sometimes have and that is sounds cannot travel through liquids and solids. Yes, they can. In wind instruments, the instrument itself vibrates. Actually, it's the wind, that you, the air that you're making go through the instrument. And here's another one that's a good one. In actual telephones, we're talking about the kind that are connected with wires. The sounds are carried through the wires. Not that either. Okay, well, you have to deal with some of those. First off, we, we should kind of understand how we actually hear sound. So let's take a, a typical diagram that you might see in a textbook of the, the workings of the ear. So you have the outer ear there, which is kind of a cup thing. And, and you often sometimes hear, see, see older people or people that are having a hard time hearing something. They'll take their hand up and kind of cup it by the ear to capture more sound so they can hear the sound better. Well, that's what that shape of that, that thing sticking out right here does. It helps to capture and focus in the sound energy that, that gets onto it. Well, our sound waves come to the ear and they go down the external, what they call it the external auditory canal, but it's that little hole that goes through the head right there. And it impinges on a flexible membrane. We call that the eardrum or the scientific name is the tympanic membrane. That starts to vibrate. And when it vibrates, there are several little pieces there called bones, which sometimes call them the ear bones. And this is the malleus, incus, and stapes. And what they do is they mechanically transfer those vibrations over to the cochlear nerve. And that nerve has hair cells inside it, and those things vibrate with those sounds or those vibrations and sends electrical signals to the brain, which we interpret as the sound that we hear. That's basically the process of how we hear the sound. Well, let's look at a few of the properties of sound. Speed. Now that's an interesting one, and we have some fun with that. Speed varies with the density of the medium. Direction, well, it goes in all directions, three dimension, like three-dimensional pond ripples. But let's take a look at the sound part here, the speed of sound. In a gas, well, how fast the sound travels depends upon the gas. But normally, if you take air at, say, sea level pressure and temperatures, well, it'll travel about one kilometer in three seconds. Now, if you convert that to the British units, one mile in five seconds. And I bet you've heard this thing before about if you see a lightning flash, count five seconds. And if, if you hear the thunder after that, that means that the, the lightning bolt was five mile, uh, one mile away. So kids will do that. And then, of course, they think, well, the sound is instantaneous when you have an event like that. But they do know how to count the distance to lightning bolts. Here's another one, liquids. And again, it depends upon the liquid. Now, fresh water, it travels a whole lot faster than it does with, with air, about uh, one and a half kilometers per second. But if you're in seawater, it's a little over a kilometer and a half per second because that water is denser. And the density is what really makes the difference. The more dense it is, the faster it goes. But now let's take a look at solids. And again, it depends upon the solid. Take granite, for example about five kilometers or three miles per second versus what it is in air, one mile in five seconds. So it's uh, really moving in solid material. And if you have a steel alloy, it even goes faster because a steel alloy is really a crystalline material that's all joined together very nicely and it, it transmits sound at six kilometers per second. And I think you've all heard about earthquake waves. Well, that's one of the applications of sound because when there's an earthquake and the waves are measured by seismographs on the other side of the earth, the seismographs are measuring those vibrations and it's basically sound waves going through the earth. Well, the speed of sound depends upon density. Here's some more properties of sound. Sounds travel in waves. Now you can get, get a misunderstanding about this, but let's first look at waves like you might have on an ocean and um, start with the terms. Wavelength, well that's the distance, distance between a wave crest and a wave crest or a wave trough and a wave trough. So that's what a wavelength is. And the amplitude, that's the up and down direction of the wave, that's the magnitude of change in these oscillations. And the one on the top in that picture there actually would be a louder sound than the one on the bottom. Frequency is another term we hear a lot about. 
and the frequency is simply the number of sound waves that pass a fixed point in one second. So on the, the far left side of the screen, we've got, a, we've got a line right there, and we're going to emit a sound from it. And the second line is the distance that sound would travel in one second. We're basically traveling through air in this case. So let's make our sound wave right there. And there it goes. Now if you count the wave crests, you start there on the, on the, the left side of the screen there. Uh, I'm sorry, on the, yeah, on the left side. And you count over to the right side, and you end up with two waves. Now we're going to have a different sound. And this time, if you count the number of crests there, we get about 3.6. And you can see the difference in the wave. Then we'll take another one. And look at that, seven. And of course, we're getting to the thousands and thousands of waves per second. So it sounds very across a wide, wide spectrum of, of energy levels and so forth. So there are many, but this is kind of a simplified version of that. Now here's a, the important point though. As the frequency gets greater, in other, in other words, the number of waves that passes that fixed point per second, when it gets greater, the pitch goes up. If the frequency gets less, the pitch goes down. That's important. Okay, well here's a, here's a typical diagram showing sound waves. You might see this in a book. And we've got a tuning fork that's uh, there by a, a tube and, and uh, we're seeing the waves as the tuning fork vibrates. The, the tines of the fork go inward, they go outward, go inward, outward at a very high rate of frequency here. And you see those waves that are traveling through the tube. That's a classic diagram there. But a matter of fact, it's not quite that way. Instead, we're looking at individual molecules of air, gazillions of them inside that tube. And when the tuning fork tines go outward, they push on that air. And when they go inward, they pull on it. So here's what happens. This is what actually the waves are like. You get those, those um, atoms being, and molecules being pushed together, and that's a wave, and then you've got a, that's like a crest, and then the area between is uh, like a trough. Now I drew lines on there to show you how that relates to that diagram. See how that works there, that the, the, wave, the wave crests are where all those atoms are put together. Now in terms of uh, actual terms here, when the waves, the molecules are all pushed together, we call that a compression. And when the tines pull back, it leaves kind of a partial vacuum. That's called a rarefaction. So the rarefaction is uh, part of that, that wave structure. So you got the compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction. That's how waves pass by. Well, we can have some fun with waves. Let's say we got two waves right here that are pretty close to each other. And what would happen if we made both of those sounds at the same time? What would happen? Well, the, the waves would kind of mix together and mingle, and I'm going to put them together now. If you look at the diagram there, you'll see that occasionally a wave crest will match a wave crest on the other wave. They, they line up exactly, almost exactly. But at other times, they are exactly opposite. A crest and a trough will line up. Now what happens here? Well, you got reinforcement of the sound, so it gets louder when the waves line up exactly, and it gets quieter, and actually cancellation when the waves get, uh, are opposite to each other. Now, I think you've probably heard of those the sound canceling headphones that you're supposed to wear in airplanes. And what they do basically is they, they kind of pull in the sound, they hear it, and uh, they, they figure out what it is, and then come up with an out of phase sound to kind of balance it and cancel some of the, the heavy noise. Mainly it's the noise like the, the whine of the jet engines to make the flight a little more comfortable for you. Well, here's, here's again how reinforcement works. Let's say we have two identical waves. We bring them together, the wave gets bigger. But if you take the two waves and you line them up so that they are out of phase with each other, you get cancellation. Here's another thing that happens. And you've probably had this experience, although it's a little harder to get this experience these days because uh, the, the sirens of uh, police cars and ambulances tend to be warbling now. They kind of go like that, and they, they, it's hard to tell. But the old days, the siren used to be just a high-pitched whine, and they would stay at that high-pitched whine. So you're standing on the street corner, and a squad car comes going right by you with a high pitch, and you get that And as it passes by, the pitch changes. We call this the Doppler effect. Look what happens here. We had the waves there. I'm going to go back on the slider for just a moment. Look at how the waves are uniformly spaced. But when the car is moving towards you, it compresses the waves in the front and stretches the waves out in the back. That changes the frequency. So the pitch goes up when it's coming towards you, and it goes down when it's going away. Now you're likely to hear this even more clearly, say at a racetrack where you got the cars going by, and you hear this, the whine sound like as it goes by you. So that, that's the kind of a, a sound that you would get with the Doppler effect. 
So the Doppler effect is kind of a neat thing because it has many applications. It's used in medicine. If you ever get, um, oh, go in for, say, an ultrasound, uh, they might turn on the sound for you and hear the whooshing sound. That's a Doppler effect. They're, they're actually measuring the flow of blood, and when the blood passes by, it changes the sound. Well, in this case here, the faster the squad car goes, the greater the pitch change. But this also works in astronomy when you're looking at stars because light will shift the same way. And you can tell whether your star is moving towards you or away from you by how the light is shifted, either to the red side of the spectrum or the blue side. Well, here's some more applications of, of sound. And uh, if you're a fisherman or a fisherwoman, well, you might want to have a fish finder, which will send sound waves into the water below your boat. And if there's a cluster of fish, like a school, it'll come back with this shadow on the screen and it'll give you an idea of how deep to set your, your bait. But you can also use this with a ship on the ocean there and use the sound waves to map the seafloor. And I'm sure you've all seen those old World War II movies where they're hunting submarines and they're shooting out sound waves and bouncing off the submarine. The waves come back and that tells them the direction and the distance and then off they go with the depth charges. You know, classic World War II movie. But here's another example. And this example right here is a medical example using ultrasound and with uh, the ultrasound, we're beginning to look into the, like, the condition of the heart. We can look at uh, uh, babies that are getting ready to be born. So many different things. And it's becoming a very common technique in medical imaging. And some people are predicting now that an ultrasound unit may be as common as a stethoscope. So sound is a very interesting topic. It's fun to learn about. Very good science. You can do mathematics. You can do physics. There's all sorts of things. You can do music. And you can see the relationship between the science of sound and the art of sound, the music. They go together. A good musician happens to be a good mathematician, too. Well, that's it for right now. What we're going to do in a, uh, next time is we're going to be doing some demonstrations using various common materials and uh, find out how you can make sound and what you can learn from it with these common materials. So we'll see you again. So long.